Well, so welcome to our presentation. My name is Corey Nikolai, and I'm a fourth year doctoral student at Virginia Commonwealth University. And in working with Allison at VCU, I've had opportunities to TA an undergraduate course and co-instruct a doctoral course. Um, additionally, I work with the VCU SOE DEI committee um, to work on decolonizing coursework, including syllabi um, and the hidden curriculum as well. And I worked with a student group that um, pushed for decolonization of courses as well. Thanks, Corey. And my name is Allison Kawenka. Um, I'm an assistant professor of educational psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University for two more days, and then I move to the University of Oklahoma. Um, so it's busy, busy month, but excited to be here. Um, and in this role as an assistant professor, um, and then prior to that as well, I've been really, really fortunate to have a lot of valuable opportunities to teach at both the undergraduate and the graduate level. Um, and as Corey mentioned, um, I've had a lot of really valuable opportunities to work with Corey. Um, and in doing so, I think that uh, you know she's taught me a lot, and we have both um, uh, done a lot of work together to really grapple with how and what um, we're teaching in educational psychology, um, which is sort of largely what inspired this symposium. So just to give a very brief introduction for why we need this symposium. Um, and there are a few different reasons that um, we thought about. I'll actually pass it over to Corey for a second, but go ahead. Yeah, so we wanna talk about the importance of decolonizing educational psychology um, and why the symposium is so important, as Allison was saying. So largely, the default in the United States is a settler colonial um, structure, and this isn't unique to the United States, um, but because this is the default, if we're not intentionally decolonizing our coursework and focusing on equity and inclusion, then the, we will be operating in a colonial structure, and so that's why we need to be really intentional about this work. And then another thing that, or another few things that we thought a lot about um, is in terms of the particular need for the symposium within educational psychology is thanks to work like um, uh, the article that was published several years ago by the group Gumby and Schutz and others, um, the literature that's typically covered in educational psychology courses um, often fails to center race um, in meaningful ways. And so that points to another important reason why it's um, important to be redundant um, to uh, to have this symposium with a particular focus on teaching and educational psychology specifically. There's also a lot of over and under representation of different student populations within this literature, in particular white middle class samples are over represented in research and students um, with minoritized racial identities, disabilities, students from LGBTQ plus populations and many others are um, pretty grossly underrepresented um, in the literature that's covered in these courses. Um, and then also, I think another really important point that Dekir Gumby and Schatz and others bring up, um, or have brought up in their work, is the racial and ethnic identity of educational psychologists in particular, um, with, with whiteness being very kind of overrepresented in this space. So I think that um, for all of these reasons, plus many more, um, it's really important to kind of get together to talk about um, this important topic uh, with a focus on educational psychology. And we also want to talk about personally um, what the catalysts were for decolonizing our coursework and then also the present symposium. So Allison and I were teaching an educational psychology course at the undergraduate level during fall of 2020. And so as we all know, we had COVID um, and then also the ever present um, racial injustices got really brought to the spotlight in 2020 as well. Uh, we are in Minneapolis um, where George Floyd was murdered and that really um, made us rethink what we were doing. Um, if we were just going to continue doing what we had been doing and what we had been taught or make some changes. And then also um, the election as well and everything that was going on politically in the United States is pretty much still tumultuous. Um, but just a lot going on and that we really need to be um, intentional to keep using that word. And then we were also inspired to put together this symposium by our incredible, thoughtful, and courageous students in our courses 
Um, you'll see some of those students um, in the presentation, and some of them are in the room today too, so thank you. <laughs> and um, also the complimentary and thoughtful group of panelists who are all doing exemplary work um, in decolonizing. So today we already had our introduction, but here's the agenda. Um, first, we'll, um, Dr. Rogers, and who worked with Dr. Shim, will present educational psychology from abstractions to practice. Um, and this is going to be drawn from a recent Division 15 wide event that they've been working on and doing this work. And so we really want to acknowledge that this work is happening and then how we can um, grow and teach through a social justice lens. And then Dr. Mateos will present engaging undergraduates in equity and justice-centered STEM teaching and learning practices. And then Dr. Emery will focus on teaching skills for social justice using case studies and educational psychology courses. And they, these presentations will both focus on case studies, course content design, and learning outcomes, classroom discourse probes, and student projects to help center um, teaching practices and equity and make the connection between the two. And then myself and then lots of students, and we can see all the names on the screen, will be presenting about evidence-based practices for teaching human development guided by theory and personal experience. And we'll draw from our coursework and then also a chapter um, that Allison and I and an undergraduate student, um, Richard Garris, um, wrote and is forthcoming. And then lastly, Dr. Usher will present in conversation with each other and the canon. And this fi pre final presentation will discuss how teachers and learners can use personal narrative and dialogues with writings from educational psychology's canon to critically explore their own and others' assumptions about learning, development, and motivation. And then we'll have time for a Q&A at the end of the session. Right, so we can call up our first um, presenter, Dr. Rogers. Thank you. co-chaired a few months ago. And uh, I, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with the, are, are aware that at the moment as educational psychologists, we are undergoing this kind of identity development, right? So we're trying to understand what it means to be an educational psychologist. What are our roles in our campuses? What are our roles in research um, in the classroom? And to this end, the division has So to that end, because I'm short, I always I don't like tall audience. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to come out a little bit. Um, so to this end, the division um, has been sponsoring this series of participatory workshops um, to examine uh, all those identity issues. And this is the express uh, explanation or the goal of, of these workshops. It's an exploration of our individual and collective identities um, with the purpose of helping us to build community identifying the needs of the division, and also problem solving. Like, what are our future goals? How can we support everybody in whatever they need in terms of, uh, for the, the purpose of this session, decolonizing educational psychology, helping us to fulfill our visions of uh, who we believe that we are and who we believe that we should be. So the workshop I want to tell you about was focused on teaching educational psychology, and I'll also say as teaching as educational psychologists, right? So not just in those classes, that are specifically geared towards educational psychology, but what does it mean to be an educational psychologist who teaches, since we're talking about identity. And I think a lot of us see ourselves as researchers first and teachers second, but we do both. And so in terms of identity development, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, we need to think about not just having a researcher identity, but also a teacher identity. So for this workshop, we had about 60 people who registered because like everybody loves registering for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> so, 
Um, over the course of the workshop, which was held virtually because everybody also loves Zoom, we had about 25 people, 26 you know, people come and go on Zoom. Um, there were largely early career educational psychologists and uh, graduate students, but I want to give a shout out to some of our veterans who, who poked in uh, and joined our groups and shared their vast knowledge and expertise as we tried to hammer out some of these issues and work our way through these issues. So we had around those 25 participants-ish, maybe up to 30 or so, and they worked in groups of five or six in breakout rooms. And each group was charged with answering three questions or thinking about three specific issues. And we used Jamboard. And here. So here are the three. The first thing we, we charged them with talking, with thinking about is what are the common experiences that we all have as teaching educational psychologists or people who teach educational psychology or just people who teach? So what are the common issues or concerns or goals uh, that everyone faced? The second thing we charged them with was thinking about the things that, that were unique to their own experiences. We all come from different institution types. We come from, you know, we have our own different goals and all of that good stuff. So, what are the things that are unique to our own experiences? And finally, what can Division 15 do about it? What are our next steps? What are, what are some of the goals that we should be undertaking with the express goal of supporting people in the issues identified in numbers one and number two? So this is just an example of the Jamboard. So in their groups, everybody had their individual Jamboards. So you can see in the upper uh, left, there are the little sticky notes that people had with what their goals were, upper right, were things that were more unique, and in the bottom is where they stuck their ideas for how we could support it, or kind of next steps for the division. And so what I'm gonna share here today was all the jam boards kind of combined into one. And I looked across uh, themes, Serena and I were shuffling between all these jam boards, trying to get some ideas. You know, after the breakout sessions, we all came to the large session and had further discussion about each one of, of these so that also pulled some of the kind of common ideas across all of the groups for the session. So when we talked about that first issue, that is, what are the things that are most common across educational psychologists and people who teach educational psychology? And the ideas came down really to teaching well. Simply put, everybody wanted to teach well. That's what it came down to. But then the question is, what does it mean to teach well then? So given when we were you know, in the pandemic life that we're living in probably for eternally now, <laughs> managing different instructional formats. So you know, once upon a time, not very long ago, we were either face-to-face, -face, so we had an online class maybe, or if you wanted to get really fancy, you had a hybrid course. And now we have high flex. And now we also have teaching loads that are probably mixed. So you might have one face-to-face, -face, you might have one that is hybrid. If you're especially unlucky, then you know, high flex or any other combination thereof, they can come up with this insanity to, to drive us nuts. But good teaching manages all of those. So you have to figure out, if you're teaching the same course in two different formats, how do you make sure that your students, regardless of format, come out with what you want them to come out with? And as a person who tends to, who have taught in a semester, the same course in different formats, that is not easy trying to give them the same experience and the same outcomes. But that's part of what it means to teach well now in the climate that we're operating in. Everybody introduced their students to research, whether they taught primarily undergraduate or graduate students. So there was always the question of how do you translate research to students, especially when they're, when they're early on, when you're talking about undergraduates or people just starting graduate school, how do you translate research to our students, and how do you do that with an equity focus? Right? Because we don't wanna just translate, we want to translate with an equity lens. We wanna teach them how to consume research. So looking at the uh, participants, the subjects in the study, looking at the research methods. Right? Are the research methods inclusive? Questioning those kinds of things, looking at the results, and then saying, well, okay, if this was the target population represented in the sample, if these are the research methods, but then what do these results tell you? Who do these results tell you most about? And so putting all of those things into context, related to that, teaching them how to do equity-based research. And truly equity-based research 
research done with an equity lens is not just about doing research with diverse populations. If you're using the same research methods, that's not necessarily equity-based research, right? So teaching students how to consume research with an equity lens and teaching them how to do research with an equity lens. Thinking about that in your methods, thinking about that in how you even analyze your data. It's not all, it's not all the same. That may mean operationally defining some terms that we dare not touch, but we need to operationally define them differently for a certain population. Because they experience those terms in a different way. One of the things I talk about with, with my students, we talk about the cell system all the time. But if you're talking about students who are you know, more, for lack of a better term, collectivistic communities, then the self is interwoven with everybody else. And so what it means to have high self-esteem is not exactly what it would always mean when we're looking at the textbook definition of self-esteem. And then finally, what this all comes down to is doing this within this culturally relevant and responsive equity framework. That's what good teaching is. So for example, if we go back to our first, we're talking about managing instructional formats. In your online classes, in your hybrid classes, have you thought about those students who may not have access to devices, or ready access to devices? In New York City at the height of the pandemic, because everybody went home at once, and New York City has like half of the world's population like in it. Like so everybody's online, and I don't care if you paid for like a super fast internet, your internet was slow because everybody else was on it at the same time. So you had students who got kicked in and out of courses, classes, and couldn't go back, right? The unique experiences, mentoring and teaching grad students, so some people taught graduates, some people taught undergraduates, some people taught a, mo a mix, that matters. Lack of resources, classroom support. So some people have small, you know, nice intimate graduate classes at you know, 12 students or so. Um, others had 60 students with no teaching assistant. Others were tasked with providing professional development to colleagues. So they held brown bags or they worked with the Teaching and Learning Center on campus. This is especially uh, re relevant for our part-time faculty who are moving between institution types all the time. And then finally, some work with a large population of students who are underprepared for college work or who have other life challenges. So they're working full-time, they have families full-time. I mean, this is a story of the City University of New York. That's the, that's, that's the population that CUNY serves. So that's, the, you know, that's what they're coming in. And so good teaching, find the bad accounts for that. So what do we do about it? Again, going back to my first comment, we have to develop a teacher identity. And that matters because when you have a teacher identity, then you seek to not just stay in abstraction, you, you seek to apply your abstraction to your own classroom practice. It, be, it becomes active in, in your life and in your classroom. Um, we need to establish ourselves as learning experts on our campuses. Not everybody actually knows even what an educational psychologist is. That is just like amazing, but it's true. We know who we are, not everybody knows who we are. So we need to make sure everybody knows who we are. And as a division, we need to create opportunities to explore what good pedagogy is. We need that space. So we can work with the, uh, the teaching at, at site uh, SIG. We can develop something of our own. We can have a database of teaching strategies and materials, whatever it is. Um, tie this to the next one here. We can offer pro uh, professional development sessions. We're all in different type, institutional types, and one of the things that we need to remember is that as educational psychologists, we are not necessarily just on research campuses. There are some of us who are at primarily teaching institutions, and so this, my teaching identity is very strong, and because of that, and because I've taught different instructional formats, I actually think I have a lot to share with people who want to learn more about teaching. So we, as a division, we should create those opportunities for people who want to sharpen their skills to do so. And this ties to what I just said. We need to think outside of just research institutions. There are a lot of research, there are a lot of you know, smaller liberal arts colleges. There are minority serving institutions. There are community colleges. There are vast majority of things, but we tend to get targeted in on the research institution. And because of all the historical reasons, students of color, and lower income students tend to be, you know, 
overrepresented at those institutions. And when we, in, when we ignore those institutions, we ignore those students. So cycling back again to what, to what they're teaching us. And that is all. myself as a novice in this work. I'm learning, I'm a new faculty, and um, there's so much I don't know that I hope to learn over time. But today's opportunity to present thanks to Corey and Allison were just really, really amazing and unique. Um, sorry. Because it's the first time I, I'm not presenting research. Uh, what I'm getting to present is just this vast kind of philosophical rambling, so buckle in. <laughs> so I am an assistant professor, I'm a new faculty. I, I just finished my second year actually. And I'm at a Catholic liberal arts college with, where I'm very happy to be. Um, and I get to teach these wonderful pre-service teachers. Um, and my favorite class happens to be the one I'm gonna talk about today, which is the integrated STEM class, the STEM teaching and learning class. And so, it's a real great uh, situation uh, because these are learners who are just, you know, they want to be the next generation of science, science and math teachers. So um, it's a real privilege to be with them. So when um, I think Corey, you were the one who invited me, said we want to talk about decolonizing uh, coursework. Can you talk about undergraduate teaching? Right? I was like, ah, do I know enough? Because I don't know if I do. But then when I really thought about how I've been revising my course over time, and with the co-constructed help of, I wanna say on the record, Dr. Chris Bradford, who originally designed the course that I've been modifying over time because it's not my course. Um, <clears throat> this is a co-constructed effort with us, but as I revise it, I realize I am moving towards what I would consider decolonization by virtue of being who I am. And this is where the Philosophical ramblings will come in. So, I share this quote from somebody who really inspires me. Um, how many of you heard of, have heard of Leonardo da Vinci, right? How many of you have heard of Rabindranath Tagore? Yes, some of you have, but not nearly as many of you who have heard of Leonardo da Vinci. And that, by nature, is the colonialization of the world, right? Uh, Rabindranath Tagore is a Bengali poet, playwright, philosopher and revolutionary. <clears throat> and just like we talk about Paulo Freire, right, um, for talking about how education can be a vehicle for getting rid of oppression, Tagore lived that and worked through that. So this is a lovely quote, an English quote, um, even though he's Bengali and I'm Bengali and much of his best work is read in Bengali. Um, this quote says, the highest education is that which does not merely give us information, but makes our life in harmony with all existence. So that's something to aspire to, and I think if we think of what the purpose of education is here, at least in the US, it's oftentimes for um, mobility and opportunity. It's not always knowledge for the sake of knowledge, or knowledge for freedom, or knowledge for advancing our spirits, right? We don't always think of learning in that sense. And this is a philosophy that he espoused that I believe in, that if you can get students to love learning for learning, then the potential is infinite. 
So I want to talk about Tagore because he is part of who I am. I'm Bengali. I'm a Bengali American and teaching in a Catholic college. And um, he's a spiritual leader and that also guides me. I can't deny that, right? Um, so I'm coming from two cultures of colonization. One being that I'm Indian and um, my historical roots come out of uh, overthrowing the British government. I, I'm not personally, in, you know, part of that. <laughs> I am inspired by those stories. Okay, I grew up with those stories. Those stories that, you know, uh, like people here don't really hear about. Um, and they are powerful stories of revolution, of, of bloodshed, of pain, of grief, of suffering, of dehumanization. Those are stories that I grew up with. Um, and I can't say that that's not part of my knowledge base, right? Uh, Tagore being a, a fierce leader in that movement uh, intellectually. So some of Gandhi's, and I'm sure you've heard of Gandhi, but some of Gandhi's best philosophies were aligned with what Tagore was actually teaching about, right? Nonviolence. Um, that education would be the way to unshackle villagers from this boundedness to a foreign government, right? That we can only um, get rid of um, imprisoning our minds by education. So that's a powerful philosophy. It also means that I come from America. I was raised here and I live in Minneapolis. This is my home actually. And Minneapolis is where the first time I encountered uh, the need for anti-racism, okay? So I, I, I know many of you know George Floyd, but actually the murder that most shook me to the core was Philando Castillo, right down the street from me in St. Paul. And it, it's a very emotional thing, right? Um, so that's why we need that, sorry. <laughs> I told you it's a philosophical rambling, so here we go. Um, so what does this mean for schooling? Well, Tagore's legacy was creating these op this open-air university. What, like, what a concept. It was so radical. He hated the idea of being constrained by four walls. So he wanted to teach. His vision was to teach outside under a mango grove. Um, and have students be have the, in, the infinite potential to keep learning till they felt like they learned. Um, so it's not about teaching, it's about learning to him. So it's student driven, it's student centered, and it's, it's embedded and connected to the universe, to nature, by way of nature. And we see these principles now here because we're learning how much indigenous wisdom is in the US, right? that these indigenous scholars were preaching the same thing. <clears throat> and I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And what's really cool about this university is that it's unlimited. Um, so um, if a student wanted to study something, they would get to bring a teacher in to teach you that. Um, that's really cool. So when Allison and Corey asked me to talk here, I realized that what I was, going, what I was doing in my own course was this epistemological inquiry. It's a long process of just reconceiving what we consider knowledge and me getting my students to continuously ask that question. That's really what we were doing. What counts as knowledge? So some three guiding questions for us is whose ideas and voices are elevated in my course? And that's a continual process of reinvention because I'm discovering new voices that I want to add, right? And my students might bring in new voices that I want to add. So that's an ongoing thing. Second is, what assumptions am I operating within that impact my own practice? So I'll kind of share a diagram of that. And then finally, what ideas are my students co-constructing? Because that's valuable knowledge that's being created right in the classroom. And that's part of the decolonizing process. So we started with ambitious science teaching. I mean, it's good instruction. It's great. Like Future teachers should have something like this, right? Um, I also considered who my speakers are, who, whose voices are coming into the classroom. And I really want to expand that and maybe even get some of your feedback on who we could bring in. Okay. I like to diversify my sources. So they're looking at Twitter threads of really outstanding teachers. They're listening to podcasts. Um, they're uh, watching uh, TED Talks, all sorts of things. They're hopefully going out into the field if they're doing their assignments too and talking to experts in the field with their community partners. 
Um, so those are the things. So these are two new um, books that we've added in the recent years. Lonnie Horn is a really great um, math education scholar. Um, but this book, Braiding Sweetgrass, changed my life <clears throat> because it solidified so many of the ways of thinking about science and the world um, that I had to bring this to my students too. Like it just makes so much sense for them to be thinking about scientific knowledge this way as well. And so um, this book really changed my life. And so one of the things that they're doing is talking about that over the course of this semester in alignment with some of the science things that we're also doing. But it's getting them to ask that question, what counts as science? What counts as scientific practice? What sorts of science are our students in the classroom bringing in that doesn't look like you know Western scientific models, right? Um, and it doesn't just have to be indigenous ones. The other thing that that book does is reminds us the connectedness to the socio-ecological frameworks we live within, um, which Megan Bain also talks about um, in her work and place-based learning and the importance of that for science teachers to really leverage. Um, so that's a, a powerful theory that uh, has guided me as well. I'm also deeply moved by Kelly Lucy Barton and Chan's work on um, rightful presence. And this, this theory, right, is really some of the justice-centered ideas that I want my students to think about for science purposes. Um, who, who gets excluded from scientific uh, teaching and learning? Why is science such an exclusionary model in the US, right? Why do we only support fast process thinkers in the classroom, right? Why are those students elevated? Why not the deeper, slower thinkers, right? Why do you have to be fast at math to be elevated in math? Why can't you think out of the box and get elevated in math? How do we recognize those in our students, right? We, we don't, that's the thing. We don't know how to evaluate our students those ways always. always. But her, their, their work really reminds me that everybody belongs in STEM, but that's not how, we, how they always get to get it in practice, right? People get moved down to lower tracks if they don't fit our current ideas about stuff. So these are the assumptions that I've been thinking about. And the kind of four at the bottom are what really matters the most. Of course, I'm reshaping the coursework all the time as I think about and learn myself. I've also been thinking about how to evaluate my students because I'm learning that. I'm a new faculty. I don't always know. Um, and I'm being very honest with you about that. And part of what really bothers me about evaluating is because it isn't decolonized at all. In fact, we evaluate based on the systems we exist within, and that's all I know until I know better. This is gonna be a work in progress. So teach me, please. Um, oh, oh my gosh. Well, and then the part that really matters to me is building relationships. This is what I do know. The better I get to know my students, the better they're getting a model for getting to know their own students. So I work a lot to get them to connect with each other. This is a type of way that we do that with book chats. Um, they talked through this book the whole time. And I had guided questions for them, but they also created guided questions. I also want them to find agency to share their knowledge in ways that make sense to them and feels fun to them. So I gotta show you this one. Um, my student designed this cereal box with all her learnings from the semester. Incredible, right? Look at the detail. Those nutrition facts are all the things she learned about like teaching practices. It's really cool. Yeah, she did crossword, talk moves, word search, right? So this is a really great example of how they apply their knowledge. I know you're playing the game already, right? Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's engaging. So these are some discussion probes. I'm sorry I'm fast running out of time. Um, but it's one of the ones that I want to really question here is, um, number three and four, right? Who is science for? And, and we see that shaping our country right now. Um, people are using Tylenol but won't take vaccine, right? Like, this is something that's an ongoing discussion we're having in our classes. How is science learning done in schools now and how could it be different? I want my students to create those new imaginings for themselves as they go through my class. Um, and I overall, this is something really important to me, I want to teach my students to always start with their students first, right? Um, this should be their first deepest knowledge base when they get into their own classroom. 
this is what they should be experts in, their own students. And then everything builds from that, and that's powerful. Um, and then to be student-centered, this is also a big theme in our class, is to demonstrate care and compassion, you know, elicit their emotions from the content, their questions, ideas, their funds of knowledge. We talk about culturally relevant pedagogy. Start with what they know and connect it back. Um, and finally, this is where I'll end, Allison, I promise. Um, <laughs> one of my students said, we don't grow where we're not loved. That's from Lonnie Horn. And that moved her the whole semester. So we talk about love and teaching and science, right? How are those things connected, okay? And then last but not least, this is my quote and you can take it. But science doesn't have to be detached and extracted, but rather can help us deepen our connection with the world around us by understanding it more fully. And if anything my students get from my course is that, how can we learn about the world better and each other better? Thank you.
even talk and colleagues tell us that decolonizing isn't a metaphor. Uh, we have to physically return items taken from indigenous people. This means land, I say, from my land hearing institution. Um, and then it also means artifacts and data collected as part of research studies. It means allowing indigenous voices to shape the narratives derived from these data that we collected. And it means choosing not to reproduce harm. So in my classroom, I choose not to reproduce content rooted in harm. An easy example is IQ. You know, I teach IQ, but not the way that the textbook plays it out. You know, we begin with the class's history. We talk about how American educational psychologists co-opted it specifically to promote eugenics. We look at other ways of conceptualizing intelligence. We compare IQ tests uh, for Americans to those created for other folks around the globe. We trace the history of educational policies informed by the notion of IQ, um, for instance, gifted education. And we talk about how those policies have contributed to what Gloria Ladson Billings calls educational debt. I also aim to avoid instructional practices that are rooted in Western ideals. So in my classrooms, there are no competitions. My point system's a little bit wacky. Students work in groups quite a bit. Um, you know, when I got to grad school and I was developing an expertise in classroom motivation, it was really fascinating to me how many most highly endorsed practices to promote motivation map on to anti-colonial frameworks that were really intentional about that overlap. It's almost as if other groups had it figured out long before we did. So when I arrived here at ISU, I noticed that our pre-service teachers tended to talk about social justice as facts to memorize rather than as actions to take. Um, our students also didn't seem to notice issues of equity any class except their social justice class, which they take right before student teaching. This was really puzzling and concerning to my, many of my colleagues and me because Iowa State's School of Education has a commitment to social justice in our mission statement. That's what drew many of us to this campus. So as instructors, we could see how we were aiming to advance students' understanding of equity, but they weren't necessarily connecting those dots. So we decided to implement the use of case studies and require classes across the teacher preparation program with the goal of helping students develop concrete skills to advance equity in the classroom. We have a shared pedagogical approach, which I'll describe in just a moment, but I want to mention that case studies are one of my favorite teaching tools. Um, and my colleague Amanda and Baker and I have a recent chapter describing why we think they're so powerful, but I'm happy to email some folks if that's interesting. Just shoot me a note after. So I mentioned we're using the cases to help students develop skills that promote social justice in their teaching practice. Our team did an extensive review and derived these seven skills from the literature. Um, I can talk more about each of these skills and how we settled on these seven with folks who are interested. And again, just send me an email. Um, but because we have experts in assessment and evaluation on our team, we refined the skills into measurable subskills and we developed a rubric to track students' development in these skills as they progress through our core unit program. So as instructors, we're grading the students' case study analyses according to our course content. Separately, as part of this empirical project, we score students' responses against this rubric. So their social justice skill score doesn't affect their grades in the course. We're using it as programmatic insight. So the cases vary by class to help students apply that particular course content the type of questions that we ask and the order in which students work through those questions is the same. Here's an example from my ad set class. In this case, the reader takes the role of the teacher. We've got a nine-year-old second grader who recently moved to your rural town. Um, you might notice right away, Mary is a little bit older than the average American second grader. So you might start thinking about um, what might be true about her prior schooling experiences, things you might want to know to support as her teacher, you notice that she re-wears outfits each week, even though you've helped get her some new clothes. Um, as part of the case, you get some information from her previous teacher. Nothing concerning came out of that. But in your class, Mary has started using colorful language. Um, and it's so disruptive. You tapped a veteran colleague for some advice. And that colleague said, get Mary to the school psychologist. Let's see if we can get her evaluated for special education. At the end of the case, um, 
we were preparing for the first parent-teacher conference of the school year. And in order to help students prepare, I give them a ton of data to sort through, um, and they need to think about what they're going to say about Mary's progress to her parents. Every semester, I'd say about 85% of my students first latch on to Mary's clothes, and they don't really address the rest of the case. So this provides an opportunity to help them practice reflexivity and look for context. We get them to unpack their assumptions about poverty, rural living, parent investment in education, etc. Um, what are some reasons a second grader might rewear an outfit? How do we go about finding the missing information before we decide whether this rises to the level of mandated reporting? About 60% of my students also latch on to this detail. Um, they initially say, Mary is causing a disruption. Let's say if we can get her into special education and that will solve my problem. So we spend a lot of time here unpacking this because the data that they get for the rest of the case doesn't justify the suggestion. Very few of my students notice the declining spelling test scores, and that's in part because I've given them a ton of information to sift through, just like a real teacher would have. They get student work samples. Um, you know, they're taking this alongside a couple of methods classes, so that helps them connect what we're doing in my class to their other courses. Um, and because this is coming on the tail end of a unit on assessment, I give them a ton of assessment data. So they get that grade book that I mentioned, they get Mary's state testing data, which has norm reference, age, and grade scores. Um, they even get a summary of an IQ test that uh, she was given when she enrolled in the district. All of the standardized data indicate Mary is typically developing. So after an independent initial reflection, the students then work in small groups to analyze the case. We ask them to list facts first, only the facts. They have really rich discussions here that prompt some additional reflexivity regarding how they might have been elaborating on missing details based on their biases and assumptions. We ask them to name those details and then pose them as questions to answer before they take action. Here is where I assess their understanding of the ed site content. Even as we're still prompting social justice skill development, I framed these questions in a manner that allows me to give them feedback on their application of the course content. So for example, they have to describe Mary's academic performance using the assessment data. And then they form a plan of action. I frame these questions in ways that should also prompt them to recall content from earlier in the course or draw on other classes. So the students have some scoring guidelines that operate essentially as a single point rubric, but I give them extensive written feedback. That's doable for me because they're working in groups, so I have fewer to grade. Um, they end up needing to produce a lot in order to, each, to meet each point of the guidelines, but they're sharing the load and refining their understanding as they work with others. If the group ends up earning less than 80% on the analysis, I give them opportunities to revise and resubmit within a few parameters. They can opt into revising without convincing their entire group. I'm going to pause here for time, but if this project is interesting at all, please get in touch with me. Um, I'd love to talk about our approach, get some feedback. There are a couple of opportunities to contribute or expand, so my email inbox is always open. And I'll end by acknowledging the original members of our research team, the other instructors who have adopted this approach in their classes, and the graduate student research assistants, without whom a project of this scope would not be possible. So thanks again, and I really hope to see you in person soon. about the spelling. The spelling? <laughs> yes, the spelling. That seems like oh. that was the answer to what I right? Do you want to be uh, dyslexic, perhaps? Uh, I'm not going to respond just because I, um, I, I don't want to speak for Alyssa, but... <laughs>
hello everyone. Thank you again for joining us and thank you to all the presenters who have gone so far. It's really exciting to hear what everyone has had to say and also see kind of how it connects to ours. Um, so that's kind of validating as well because I think um, like you, Dr. Mateos, too, I feel like I'm pretty new in this journey too as like a PhD student being involved in higher education and then also um, like focusing on intentionally decolonizing. Um, so I am sharing our presentation, Evidence-Based Practices for Teaching Human Development Guided by Theory and Personal Experience on behalf of our wonderful team um, whose names are listed on the screen. And all of our team consists of students in the courses that Alice and I have taught at the graduate and undergraduate level on human development and educational psychology. So thank you to everyone on this team for all the work that you've put towards this presentation and then also for all the great conversations that we've had in the course as well and all of your dedication to learning. And so as a little bit of context, this presentation was inspired by a forthcoming chapter um, that Allison and I wrote along with Richard Garys, who is an undergraduate student, um, and you'll get to hear a little bit of, um, from him later in this presentation as well. And so this chapter focused on strategies we use to center equity and inclusion in undergraduate, um, the undergraduate educational psychology course that we taught. And also as we're putting together this presentation, as we've grown um, from that chapter, now we're trying to focus intentionally on decolonizing and not only um, centering equity and inclusion. Um, by decolonizing, um, those things will happen, um, but you kind of need to like try to tear things down um, to get there in a way. I'd like to, Dr. Mateos was um, speaking a little bit about like who these courses have been created for. Um, and then also we draw from our experiences um, in a graduate level development course that Allison and I taught. So a quick roadmap of what we'll be covering today. First, we're gonna talk about what to do before and while decolonizing. We'll discuss strategies for decolonizing and that's where we'll get to hear from students and they'll share examples of what um, strategies they thought were really impactful in the courses. And then also we'll share how it connects to theory. It'll be really quick. So if you want more of that, you can read our forthcoming chapter. <laughs> um, and then lastly, we'll share some resources. So first, what to do um, before revamping. And these strategies are based on brainstorming sessions that Allison and Richard and I had, so thank both of you. Um, so first, we wanna get put forth for you to do some introspection and reflect on your positionality. Dr. Mateus, again, already started to touch on this too. Um, what assumptions are you bringing into the course and the content you're teaching and even how you're teaching? Um, how does this affect um, how you interact with um, students and how does that in impact students and how they interact with you as well. Um, and also reflect on how you learned those things as well, um, especially those assumptions that you have. Um, I think it's been really impactful to think about how and why um, I think the things I think. Um, and then we also recommend Miller uh, 2007 article um, and we'll share that resource as well. And he puts forth some really great resources and questions for research, researchers to start asking about the um, people that they are um, interacting with for research, but I also think you can like apply that um, for teaching as well. And then reflect on who is or who is not represented, and we've heard um, that also throughout the presentations from Dr. Rogers and Dr. Mateus as well. Um, so not only just the identities, but also those views and values that are represented in your coursework as well. And then third, we recommend deepening your own understanding um, before and while you're doing this work. And then also specifically uh, reading outside of educational psychology. Um, we have done this work and we have some great scholars who have been doing this work, but there's other fields on like critical race theory, on critical whiteness studies, on black feminism that have been doing this work for much longer than we have. Um, and so we don't really need to reinvent the wheel there. Um, just to use that, maybe some other people had it figured out before we did. <laughs> and then lastly, seek feedback from your students. And to do this, you also need to create a space where students are comfortable giving you that feedback. You can't just ask them if you haven't created that, where um, they know that you, they can trust you. Um, like Allison mentioned, that Destiny has brought up. Like, with that feedback, trust is so important. And I think it both works both ways when you're receiving feedback and giving feedback. Um, and then also, when you receive that feedback, it might be critical. And if it is, that means you've developed a good relationship with your students. So that's a good thing. 
Um, so when you do that, um, this is Dr. Tamika Ferguson at VCU. She said that we feel guilty sometimes about that, um, but to use that guilt and reframe it as conviction, that you are dedicated to this work, um, because sometimes we can get stuck in that guilt. Um, and so just use that, that you want to keep improving. So next, these are the different strategies that we'll be covering. And each of these strategies were developed um, by Alice and I in, cor in courses um, that we taught. And so we'll briefly cover each strategy in the presentation. Um, but again, you can read the chapter. Um, but we'll go into more detail. So for the first strategy we put forth is to get to know your students. And again, Dr. Mateus um, did this, talked about this too. So, um, And then also affirm your students as well. So for example, in our course, um, for the undergraduate course, we sent out surveys, and in the graduate course as well, but we sent out surveys um, before the course to ask students about their goals, their hobbies, um, their access to technology, um, because we were online at that point. Um, and additionally, we asked questions of the day each um, time we met, so that students could connect um, their own experiences and their own knowledge with what we were learning in the course content. And so next, Richard, um, who was an undergraduate student, in the course that we taught and is the co-author on the chapter and he's the second author for this presentation we'll talk about the importance of this strategy getting to know our students allows us to make properly relevant content for them it allows us to acknowledge and validate their backgrounds and the end of the things that they come from it creates a sense of ownership in the classroom and gives them a place of space for them in the classroom it's all about understanding where they're coming from so that we can help them get to the places where they want to be. So as Richard mentions, this can build ownership or autonomy in the classroom. And as we know from SDT, this promotes intrinsic motivation. And as Richard mentions, it affirms students' identities and cultures and creates space in the classroom, which promotes belonging. Additionally, creating this space allows room for counter storytelling, which is a tenet of CRT. And then lastly, and not shockingly, drawing from the feedback literature, we know that affirming students supports motivation as well. And so the second strategy that we'll discuss today is to incorporate voices and experiences into the structure of the course. And so Tanya, who is a PhD student and an undergraduate advisor at VCU and was enrolled in our graduate level human development course, will share an example of how we incorporated this strategy into the human development course and how it works towards decolonization. Before the course got underway, students could review a list of authors and vote for each unit's readings. When we discussed them, it was encouraged to draw connections to the material from our lived experiences. Being allowed to choose readings, make texts more tangible, and develop critical writing techniques in class decolonizes research in three important ways, viewing its function, determining one's approach, and freedom from thoughts of inferiority. So drawing from SCT, incorporate, incorporating student voice into the syllabus um, supports relevance and autonomy, which again um, supports intrinsic motivation. Um, furthermore, like Tanya mentioned, it decreases feelings of inferiority or increases competence, again, supporting motivation. And then by incorporating student voice in the structure of the course, we interrogating how whiteness as property, another tenet of CRT and critical whiteness studies shows up in our courses and who we're um, assuming has knowledge. So the third theory that we'll, or strategy that we'll discuss today is to intentionally disrupt the power structure. And so Danny will, who is also a PhD student, and I'll point her out over there, <laughs> um, We'll share an example of how this showed up in our graduate level human development course. Corey and Allison's course was different from any other I had previously taken at the undergraduate or graduate level as power structures were much less noticeable. Our course discussions consistently felt like conversations and our thoughts were viewed as valuable and never strictly right or wrong. You could clearly notice that students in the course had increased levels of competence and comfortability as Allison and Corey worked to develop relationships with each and every one of us. It felt as if our words and experiences were just as valuable as theirs. 
So, like Dr. Timote oh my gosh, Dr. Mateus um, also discussed um, whose knowledge is um, valued and is counted as knowledge. And so, from a colonized viewpoint, there's a hierarchy in the classroom um, that reflects who has knowledge to share and teach others. And so, by recognizing this um, and calling into question who has knowledge and who can share knowledge, um, we can decolonize the course. And then also, this aligns with Ferry's critique of banking education, where the teacher and instructor just pours into students and students are empty vessels to receive. And so additionally, by affirm, valuing and affirming students' knowledge and support, this supports competence as well. So the third strategy that we'll discuss is to give students choice on assignment topics, type, and timing. And so to talk, Okay, Richard will discuss um, next how we did this. And so this imports, um, points to the importance of decolonization. I developed an Army lesson that gave students a choice to do a bachelor's study with one of six different artists. These artists were not just Eurocentric, but also came from diverse cultural backgrounds. This not only validates the culture's way of producing art and their skill set, but also gives students a choice of whose skill set is most relevant to them Students were given the opportunity to bring up artists that was not on that list, um, one that had a personal meaning to them, or one that was more well known to their community or background. Um, students to do this creates a deep responsibility and ownership. Students care more about the outcome of the lesson, whether they were successfully demonstrated that artist's skill set, due to the fact that they had hand created the parameters of the lesson. So I'll try to breeze through this. Time, but um, again, as Richard just, uh, mentions, this gives students um, a sense of control and autonomy over the content that they're learning. Um, also, from it helps us as instructors be able to recognize our blind spots and leave up space open for students to bring in um, what they think is important to discuss um, and how it'll best help them reach their goals. So the third strategy we'll discuss is to give open book and untimed exams. And so by doing this, we can support um, getting mastery achievement goals. I think Dr. Rogers talked about it. How do we get students, or I saw it on a sticky note, um, with students um, wanting to memorize the material and how can we get students to not. So one way that we did that um, was giving open book untimed exams. So students could focus more on how to apply the material and think critically about the material. Um, and then also by removing the timing aspect of that, we work to decrease um, the anxiety that can especially happen with stereotype threat, um, which targets, um, well, stereotype threat affects historically marginalized um, students more so. And then also, um, this is more flexible with students' um, schedules. So if they need to start the exam and then stop it and take it later, that is fine. Um, if there are children there and they need to pay attention to other things, they're not gonna run out of time because they need to step away. And then our last strategy that we'll discuss um, is giving detailed feedback to students. And so Maggie and then Molly, who are also in the room here today, and they are doctoral students I'm at BCU and they were in the graduate level human development course, will share an example of this feedback and how it works for decolonization. Allison and Corey have done a great job of continuously uncovering the hidden curriculum in academia through feedback. For example, in all of the classes I've taken with Allison, she has continuously stressed the importance of conveying the overall practical, broader, and educational significance of our work early on in our writing. This translates extremely well into other important skills such as grant writing and is not always explicitly taught. This course and its instructors stood out to me because of the consistent and formative feedback that we received as students. Allison and Corey provided such thoughtful feedback on our weekly assignments, our capstone papers, and even on the comments we made in class. And not only did this practice really help me grow as a student, but I also learned a lot about how to decolonize my own language and vocabulary as a researcher. So drawing from SEBT and then also the feedback literature, we know that guidance for 
by providing guidance for improvements that supports competence beliefs, and then additionally providing this detailed guidance about the norms um, and writing in our fields, we're exposing the hidden curriculum. And by exposing this hidden curriculum, we're recognizing that not everyone readily has access, and some people are actually blocked from the access purposefully um, to academic writing. And we can talk about academic writings and norms of it and how that's also whiteness as property. Um, but by exposing that, and we can look back at academic writing that was I think I saw in Dr. Usher's slides as well that when we look at it, there's a lot of white wealthy men and they're the people that created a lot of the norms in academic writing and we don't all fit into that. And so we are recognizing that connection to whiteness as property, who gets to exclude people from academic writing, um, who gets to exclude people whose value, um, knowledge is valued. Um, but I will move on to our resources since I think I am over time. Um, so if you want to, you can scan this QR code. Um, afterwards, if you can't get it um, with it being so far away, um, we can also pull it on our laptops. Um, but these resources are um, to get you started on decolonizing. And so they're both within EdPsych and outside. So some of these resources include questions for reflection, that Milner article that I mentioned. Others about, are about colonization, both at the K-12 level and higher ed. And while we might want to jump into decolonizing, and I think it is really important not to say, wait until you're ready, because we'll never be ready. Um, we're always learning. Um, it's crucial to understand what colonization really is. In order for us to dismantle it, we really need to know what it is, how it shows up, and recognize that a lot of us um, haven't been able to see it, or we are intentionally taught not to see it, see it as well. And so this isn't to say don't take action, um, but really work to deepen your own understanding um, before and while you're doing it. And recognize that you are probably going to feel some feelings of guilt and to use that in conviction. So thank you all for listening. Um, if you have any questions, you can email myself or Allison. Um, and so thank you all for listening.
thank you for that's like perfect and um we're gonna have lots of time afterwards for discussion but thank you for raising that question and yeah, anonya thank question. you for yeah for, no i'm so grateful that you waited thank you for doing that how are you doing out there do you need a stretch <laughs> like, like a 10 second stand up and move around i mean it's been almost two hours you've been sitting well an hour and some but if you need to take a quick stretch feel free i know i was happy to stand up <laughs> Ten seconds. uncomfortable sometimes, unfamiliar uh, for white folks territory. Um, so when I was thinking about this symposium, I thought, well, let's talk about what it means to be in conversation with each other, because we're trying to do this here. And I can tell it's going to be a lively one after I finish. Um, and with the canon. And so what is the canon? Um, that may not be a familiar term to everyone. The canon, the Merriam-Webster defines it as a regulation or dogma decreed by a church council. Um, let's, take, let's take this one. A sanctioned or accepted group or body of related works. Um, and I like the image of the gatekeeper because in some ways the canon um, is sort of, well, do you know these people? Because if you don't, then, you know, are you really an educational psychologist? Um, and what does it mean to be in conversation with these guys? Um, well, we kind of have to, in some ways, to, to enter into this world of educational psychology as it's defined by many of these structures. Um, by, I guess, all dead white guys, right? And in my world, in the world of motivation, a uh, few women made it. I'm just, I just picked these people. Of course, there are more than this. And if you're out there and feel offended that your picture's not here, I'm sorry. <laughs> Why is it important for us to be in conversation with each other and with the canon? Uh, a couple of metaphors. This looks like my drive. I now live in Minnesota, down the road in Rochester. Um, and I, uh, this is what it looks like on the way back. And it's a metaphor, isn't it, for how uh, right after, let's say we're all in the big red barn right now here at APA, uh, and then we'll all retreat to our silos. Our little comfortable, I don't know, maybe home office, or uh, soon to your campuses or other offices. Um, put your heads down and do your busy work in the silos that are, re have plenty of reward structures for you. And often we're not talking across them, um, except for these rare and wonderful places where we come together to talk a little bit. So that can be limiting. Um, and it can make it, this happen, you know, that we're wearing blinders. In some, in some ways it might be to be human, is to some extent to have blinders on, uh, framed by our own experiences, our own backgrounds. Um, so 
these are the dangers. So I want to make this a really practical ending to and then and beginning of our conversation to how we can better converse with each other and better converse with the canon. And as I go through 10 ways, um, I hope that you'll think about them both in your, if you have an instructional role as a teacher, but also just as a scholar, um, as to how you might engage these. So, and these are gonna sound redundant, which is great. We're triangulating what we think about decolonizing practices. Um, and maybe there, there'll be more than this. But first, understand our own worldview and our own assumptions. Um, here are the big philosophy words up here. Remember this, like, what does it mean to be real? Uh, how do we get to know reality? I'm invoking Paul Schitt's now. Um, what approach is most useful to get to this reality? We all have an answer. We have an inquiry worldview. And I've learned a lot from Paul and others about this. Um, but we may not know what it is. And so a first step is to interrogate that and try to get to how do I think we come to know motivation, for example, or self-development or, um, and so I take a particular worldview in, in, in exploring that. And it may be different than Ananya's worldview, which I, you know, it's lovely your talk is bringing in a, a different cultural perspective than what I'm familiar with and I really appreciated that. And for teachers of teachers, I think the first place that I begin in a course, like an ed psych course, is tell me your story. So some introspective, autobiographical work. Let's begin with me search before the research, right? Like, the, what, what does it mean for, what was your education like? And then sharing that across to understand um, how that's similar or different. I've heard so many students, often young white women, say, oh, you know, I just had the normal um, childhood. And, you know, that has to be explored. So as we interact with others, um, try to understand their worldview and assumptions. What is at the center of their vision? What was B.F. Skinner's center? What was he thinking when he was writing? What, where was he coming from? And can I, can I try that on for a second and try to understand it from his perspective in his sociocultural moment? Um, in his educational history, but even just student, teacher to student, trying to understand my students, where they're coming from. This is hard. Um, third, read different perspectives and take note of the differences, and particularly read those of people who have, who are on the margins of mainstream. And I, I guess I'm speaking a lot to people like me, um, wait, to white person to white person, maybe saying, read diverse perspectives that aren't familiar. One of the most interesting uh, assignments I ever had in grad school was from Frank Pajares, who uh, taught a class called the Philosophical and Psychological Foundations of Education. It was my <coughs> philosophy class, and my only psych class I think I've ever taken. Uh, that's a confession here, don't tell them. <laughs> um, and the only assignment was, uh, pull quotes from the readings that we do that resonate with you and that capture the essence of the, the, read, the philosopher we're reading and put them on a website. And so I went a little overboard. I sometimes did that. <laughs> so I made this website of all the scholars we read. And so all the people, the, we were reading the canon largely, I want to say. Maxine Green was a little bit beyond the canon. Um, but we were reading the canon and, and some other people. And, and so I started extracting quotes that I thought essentialized their point, but also that resonated with me. I have a separate webpage, which is those that resonated with me. And they became my educational philosophy. I just borrowed other people's, like, mixed them together, cafeteria style. And like this is just, I added to this after that course. This was actually years after, a couple years after grad school. Uh, Maxine Green, whom we read in his class, gave a talk at ADRA, and I quoted, I was pulling quotes from her talk. I was doing the same last night with um, William Cross, who gave the, who received the Lifetime Contribution Award. I was pulling some things out of what he was saying, like, because I think it's cool to collect what people say. Don't collect mine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it became a resource for me. I don't think anybody knows where this exists on the web. It's just for me. It's totally, it's still out there. 
but it's, all, it's just mine. It's, I go there when I need a quote or I need to remember. So what was um, John Stuart Mill all about, you know? Four, take a uh, question that taken for granted. Um, ask for whom and under what conditions, under what circumstances might these truths hold or not hold. Uh, in all affairs, it's a healthy idea to hang a question mark on the things we've long taken for granted. I, I, heard, I heard similar ideas here today. Turn your, your conclusions into a working hypothesis, as I think Lee Cromack said. And this one's from Carol Gilligan. Um, theory blinds observation. You know, once we have a way of seeing things and a frame for seeing it, it tends to um, skew what we see next. I was taking a walk in Rochester around this uh, park, and I passed a field, uh, and then I was directing somebody to the soccer fields. I was like, it's over there near the soccer fields. And he said, oh, you mean the lacrosse fields? And I was like, I don't know what that is. Because um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't play lacrosse. It was not in my schema. Um, apparently, they have different goals. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but in that moment, I also said, oh my gosh, you know, my prior knowledge guides what I see. So we are perceptually blind. It's experiential blindness. Like If I haven't experienced this before, chances are I'm not going to be seeing it. So looking for those those things requires some suspension or so some sort of reflective capacity to go oops um, you know I didn't I didn't see that and I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't been corrected I was interviewing back after grad school and one of the interviewees said so could you critique social cognitive theory what do you think is its main um, downside and I just went uh, <laughs> I wasn't ready, but I think once we've learned our theories well, then we also need to create, you know, develop and exercise some critical awareness of where they fall short. Don't ask me about that later, because it's hard. Like, that's really hard to do even now. Um, so, but, but we need to be prepared to do that. This has been mentioned already. Read outside your discipline. So the connections is where the good stuff happens. Not only connecting to your own personal experience, which, which I think you two both uh, do in your classes, encouraging students to connect to something outside your personal experience. It could be literature, film, TV. Um, I've learned so much from reading in medicine or in like engineering and talking to people in other disciplines as well. It's, it's quite enlightening. Find and invite counter or alternative perspectives and explanations. Share them with others. So this, is, to me, is a great teaching tool. Um, tell me when this is not true. When, when does behaviorism not work as an explanation? Give an example of that. If you find it, I want you to bring it in. Or tell me where you know self-efficacy is not a matter of having had a mastery experience in the past. There's some other source of it. Bring an example of that. Counter the, the theory, bring a counter example. This can help everyone. I think to be really persuasive, we need to stay in conversation with the canon. So that means understanding what is the canon. Now, this is a disputable idea. Like, should we even read the white men's work? <laughs> um, so that maybe we can discuss that shortly. But one person who I thought really did this well is a man named Mark Minsky, who was an MIT um, artificial intelligence scholar, and he wrote this book, uh, The Emotion Machine. So he's trying to convince the reader that emotions are um, nothing more than, uh, could be artificially uh, you know, created uh, through AI. And to do this, he used this kind of style. This is just a random page. I'm not trying to make his point here or articulate it, just to show you what he did. Try writing like this. He would take the perspective of different people. So he'd be like, mystic. And he'd write what a mystic might be thinking right now in response to his argument. And then he's like, psychoanalyst. So he writes what a psychoanalyst would be thinking. Existentialist, sentimentalist. So he's making, presenting counter arguments and his own position. Sometimes he'll write student, colon, and what a student might be thinking right now. Or just citizen. Like just your average person might be thinking. And it shows this 
brilliance of t perspective taking in his writing that strengthens his ultimate argument because he's heading off others. And last but not least, uh, be unafraid to challenge norms in the field. And I'm gonna bring us back to something that I just by happenstance read in one of the things Maxine Green said in that talk at AERA. She quoted John Dewey, because we are afraid of speculative ideas, we do and do over and over again an immense amount of dead specialized work in the region of facts. We forget that such facts are only data that is, our only fragmentary, uncompleted meanings, and unless they are rounded out into complete ideas, a work which can only be done by hypotheses, by free imagination of intellectual possibilities, they are as helpless as our all named things, and as repellent as our needlessly thwarted ones. It's a pretty, pretty nice way to end. So I hope those tips are helpful for us moving forward, and I look forward to our discussion now. Thank you.